y'all, I'm Kitty, and this podcast is mine, Missing, Murdered, Unidentified in New England. I cover cases from the New England states of Connecticut, Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Vermont. Each episode takes place over the month of each year between January 1st, 2010 and December 31st, 2020. And based on sources, some episodes will be long and others will be short as these cases don't generally have much information available. All of the research, scripting, opinions, and mistakes here are my own, and I will offer updates and corrections when possible. I do not offer trigger warnings for wounds as they are a necessary part of the narrative. I will trigger warn for such topics as suicide, animal death, domestic violence, etc. as needed. Now with that, please listen in as I tell you about August 2010. We start August with 30-year-old, fashion-forward, basketball-loving, wonderful dad of four, Timmy Knighton, who became another victim to gun violence on August 6, 2010. Just before midnight, Timmy was sitting in his car between 86 and 92 Oak Street in Springfield, Mass., when a gunman shot 20-plus shots into Timmy's torso. Shots caught by the police shot spotter a device utilized to detect gunfire and triangulate where it occurred. Timmy was chilling with friends in his car right before the murderer struck. Although there were several people present at the time of Timmy's senseless slaying, they didn't cooperate at all with police, and police did not disclose possible motives. EMTs were sent to the wrong location, leading to Timmy succumbing to his injuries. No arrests have been made. Since Timmy's death, his ex-wife Jennifer raised all four of Timmy's children, and his daughter Selena won an ultimate prom contest in 2014, discussing the importance of finishing school. Selena received a tuxedo and shoe rental, flowers, hairstyling and makeup, and a double-decker bus ride. After all Selena had been through, and staying in school and working towards goals, she definitely deserved a cool experience like that. She was going to be an EMT. She was going to be a heart surgeon. Because nobody helped her father, says Jennifer Brown, Zyasia's mother. Timothy Knighton's daughter, Zyasia Knighton, is an EMT, an emergency room patient care technician, a member of the Massachusetts Air National Guard, a full-time medical science pre-med student, and a trained ballet dancer who appeared on So You Think You Can Dance. Zayasia earned positive reviews from the show's judges. Zayasia also plays volleyball. Zayasia made it through four months worth of auditions before her time on the show came to an end. If you know who killed her father, Timothy Knighton, please call 1-800-494-TIPS. 18-year-old Amos Brown Jr., known as Famous Amos to Friends, was ambushed in a calculated broad daylight gun attack on Friday, August 13, 2010, at 1.52 p.m. This ambush happened on Lexington Ave in Norwalk, Connecticut, near El Coqui Grocery. Amos survived the gunshot wounds, only to be taken off of life support at Newark Hospital two days later and dying that Sunday evening. Before I go into detail about Amos's death, it is imperative to discuss his history that likely contributed to his daylight murder. In 2009, Amos was acquitted for murdering 16-year-old Taekwon Hunt during a 2008 melee that resulted in multiple stabbings. Taekwon's killing was part of a 75 to 100 juvenile melee that began at a Landon street party. Amos stabbed Taekwon in the heart after Taekwon pointed a gun in his face. Amos said he felt his life was in danger. Taekwon had shot one person and had a loaded 38 that was found in his pants. These kids knew each other. Amos and Taekwon, they played football together as younger children. They were childhood friends. I say kids because these are still children, young, dumb, and full of a lifetime of struggles that led them down the wrong pathways. You see, Taekwon was part of the Money Green mob, a claim his mother denies. A mob who got their start in the Meadow Gardens housing complex of Meadow Street. Between the slaying of Taekwon and Amos's confession, which he turned himself into provide once a warrant was issued for his arrest, threats were made against him, his family, and shots were fired at his home. 
These threats led Amos's dad, a well-liked man at the community, to seek help from police. Amos Sr. also talked to numerous participants of the melee, convincing some to testify on Amos's behalf at trial. After Amos was acquitted of Taekwon's death, he and his father went to Georgia, but returned the f- December before his death to Connecticut after not finding work. This after Amos's dad refused to let Amos leave the house for safety reasons. Now that we have the backstory, we jump forward to August 13th, 2010, to Amos's gang retaliation ambush and calculated slaying. Amos was driving in his black Honda at roughly 1.50 p.m. when a gold car and a 2010 Chevy Malibu stolen from Enterprise Rent-A-Car on Main Street in Norwalk with two passengers began shooting at Amos' car at the corner of Lexington and Orlean Streets, which happens to be the intersection where Taekwon Hunt's friends hang around. The two cars stopped 100 feet up the road from where the shooting started. The gunman exited the vehicle and shot at Amos, who was coming in the opposite direction. A tall, skinny black male, wearing a long red t-shirt with lettering on it, and shorts, got out of the got out of the gold car firing their pistol at Amos's car and the silver Volvo up the road driven by Joseph Bateman, Amos's cousin, he called for help, who tried to move his car around Amos to give him a chance to escape, but Amos never got the chance to escape. Joseph got out of his car and returned fire. Amos's Honda rolled backwards, crashing into the side of El Coqui Grocery. Amos had been shot in the back of the head at some point during the chaotic scene. The man in red walked down a nearby driveway, but was unable to find an escape route. He then took off his red shirt and proceeded to stroll away in a white shirt. Joseph allegedly knew who the gunmen were, but refused to cooperate with authorities. Amos' funeral was August 23, 2010. The suspects are three black males who were teenagers or in their early 20s, now early 30s. This tale of death, retaliation, and more death doesn't end with Amos's death. More lives have been taken and more families changed forever due to this ongoing feud. Police know who is involved in all of this, but witnesses are unwilling to cooperate. Tit-for-tat retaliatory killings between neighborhood gangs tied to this one incident spanned over three years and destroyed countless lives in the process. Joseph Bateman, Amos's cousin, was himself gunned down on February 3, 2012, and was once shot through the cheek in a 2011 attempted carjacking, where two men in black approached his car trying to steal it, but Joseph fought off the would-be carjackers with his girlfriend in the car, who was too startled to drive afterwards. According to their accounts, the police doubted their story as there wasn't evidence supporting this. Joseph's killer was found five years later. His name was Hakeem Atkinson just 22 when tried and convicted, and 17 at the time he gunned down Joseph. Another shooting victim was Amos's girlfriend, who was shot in the left hamstring while inside her own home. The victim of a drive-by shooting, when five people were inside the house and five shots fired as a deadly warning with no other injuries, making me think that maybe she also knew who killed Amos and was being threatened into silence. There was a lot of gun violence and retaliation tied to Amos. Most shooting victims in 2011 had ties to Amos's death in some way. Amos's cousin, a 19-year-old girl, was hunted by a car full of men in Norwalk, Connecticut, and escaped with a gunshot wound to the hand. Another cousin of Amos's was Michael Mizzy Robinson, who was shot while walking near South Main Street and Grove Street in Connecticut. Mizzy had a three-year-old daughter and was playing with her and his girlfriend just days before his untimely death. Missy's killer was 25 at the time and 30 at the time of his arrest. His name is Ibo Boone. There were also multiple drive-by shootings committed towards homes not tied to Amos, as well as dwellings of people tied to this were targeted instead of their current inaccurate addresses. Another series of deaths involved Kyle Freetag, who gunned down members of Meadow Garden's gang thought to be responsible for Amos' death. Kyle murdered Dijon Johnson and seriously wounded another young man. He received 30 years for his crime, a sentence that Amos's dad was saddened at the length of, believing Kyle should have received leniency. At one point, Kyle was shot in the neck while wearing a shirt with Amos and Joseph on it. 
Kyle was a known gang member who testified in Amos's murder trial and became a target for the Meadow Gardens gang. Kyle felt threatened because Dijon and other young men were riding near Kyle's work and he feared retaliation, so he claimed to have killed before he was killed himself. Now that we have discussed death upon death and violence galore, there are also peaceful events tied to Amos. On August 21st, 2010, there was a March for Peace and March to End Gun Violence, where a small group of citizens marched to bring attention to gun violence and the impacts on youth in the community. On the fourth anniversary of Amos's murder, Chinese lanterns were released in remembrance. Amos's dad is anti-gang and anti-gun violence, and he speaks at conferences and is assisting in revising gun control legislation. Please call 1-800-494-TIPS. Amos Sr. sat down for an interview for News 12 Brooklyn in August of 2022, 12 years after his son was murdered. Amos Sr. was the senior VP for the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, for three terms. He was my strength and my weakness. Amos Brown Sr. is still seeking justice for Amos Brown Jr., his son who was gunned down on August 13, 2010, and who was taken off of life support two days later. According to Amos Sr., I had to play a part in his death. I had to turn off the switch. Amos Jr.'s murder was a retaliation killing, and the Money Green Gang, they was determined to murder my son, said Amos's dad. Police have information on who was there and who was involved, but the people themselves remained silent. I did everything I know how to do to get justice for my son as much as putting my life on the line. Amos Sr. warned his son that these people were out for him, and since they, quote, couldn't beat him with fists, they ambushed him. Amos Sr. tried to get the Money Green Gang to leave his son alone, but to no avail. There was a hit list of people that the Money Green Gang had it out for. Two of the people on the list were actually murdered. When in Georgia, Amos Jr. thought it looked as though they were running, and cowardice were for running, and leaving the four remaining people on the hit list behind. Though Amos Sr. knew nobody was there to help those boys, he had to say what he could to calm his son down. When things didn't work out in Georgia, the pair came back, and that's when the Money Green Gang ambushed Amos Jr., killing him. Amos Sr. created a large banner chronicling the children the Money Green Gang had murdered and called them out for their heinous and cowardly actions. The gang did not respond. Amos Sr. thought that if they had shown their faces, he would have. He would have been outnumbered himself and murdered, yet he was still willing to make that sacrifice of no return. When asked in the interview who killed his son, Amos Sr. said that a lot of names flashed around, but he didn't know the trigger puller yet, and that everyone in the crime scene on the day of Amos' murder was guilty and should have been stopped in 2003. After calling out the Money Green Gang, Amos Sr. says there haven't been any more murders at their hands. Amos Sr. says the police know who the murderers are and that the community knows who committed the murders, but are too afraid to come forward. Amos Sr. says that they can come forward anonymously. There is a $50,000 reward for Amos Jr.'s murderers arrest and conviction. Amos Sr. has faith that the murderer of his son will be brought to justice. If you or someone you know killed Amos Brown Jr. on August 13, 2010, please call the Norwalk Police Department Investigative Service Bureau at 1-203-854-3111 or Detective Chris Imperato at 1-203-854-3190 or by submitting a tip at norwalkpd.com or by texting the word Norwalk PD, all one word, into the text field, followed by the message, and sending it to 847 411. David Santos Martins was a 30 year old man born, raised, and killed in Dorchester, Mass. At 9 30 p.m. on August 12, 2010, at 531 Adams Street, across from the Hemingway Park, two people were shot. David suffered a life-ending wound and was declared deceased at Boston Medical Center, and the other person, an unnamed teen, was shot multiple times and survived their injuries. There is no description of the suspect, 
and possible motive for the shooting has never been released. A memorial scholarship was created through the David Martin's Peace Foundation and awarded to a worthy winner. Please call 1-800-494-TIPS. We stay in Dorchester, where 39-year-old Terrence Small was found across from 2 Shafter Street on August 17, 2010. Terrence had been shot multiple times and was discovered laying on the ground and pronounced deceased at Boston Medical Center. Please call 1-617-343-4470 or 1-800-494-TIPS. 26-year-old Jamil Harmon had a signature laugh, one that others still fondly recall. Though Jamil was senselessly slain on August 18, 2010, he enjoyed time with his son, Treshawn Boyd, and Sakara Boyd, his wife, and Treshawn's mom. Jamil was stabbed at 12.30 p.m. at 600 block of Blue Hill Avenue between Seaver Street and Columbia Road in the Roxbury area of Boston. What is infuriating about this case is that, like others, there were witnesses around, people to help, to call for police, to see who committed this heinous stabbing. Yet nobody spoke up. It is shameful. It is sad. A human being was attacked in broad daylight and taken to Boston Medical Center via Boston EMS, where he was pronounced dead. And as an even sadder aftermath, Trey Sean Harmon himself, Jamil's young son, was gunned down by 18-year-old Deventi Walker just before 8.30 p.m. on January 11, 2020, just blocks away from where his dad was stabbed almost a decade earlier. Treshawn graduated the English High School in Jamaica Plain and was taking engineering classes at a local community college and working alongside his mom, Sakara, at the Sweet Green restaurant prior to his murder. Please call 1-800-494-TIPS. James Therian was a 52-year-old white male with hazel eyes, brown hair, and a goatee when he disappeared on August 25, 2010, the evening after a daytime fight with his sister Monica, whom he lived with on Thompson Street in Sanford, Maine. James would be 64 now, if still alive. James was 5 foot 6, 205 pounds, and at about 7.30 that night he disappeared, as Monica, his sister, was watching television. She heard James say, oh well, and then he left the shared apartment wearing a dark blue long-sleeved jersey and leisure pants. Monica felt responsible for James's disappearance, saying that she wishes she had called him, or looked where he went. James took his wallet, left behind his keys, medications, and glasses. When he didn't immediately return, Monica thought James had gone to a meeting. It wasn't specified what kind of meeting, though AA and NA are often to be found at this time of night. James has not been formally identified since. Monica waited up until midnight that night, then 2 a.m., and reported James missing at 3 a.m. It was uncharacteristic of James to leave without warning, as he was a reported homebody. This, according to Monica, who disputed couch surfing rumors about James. Among other troubles, James has chronic pain from gout, and due to this, he has trouble walking. James also has arthritis and was dependent on pain medications when he disappeared. All of his 11 medications were left behind. There have been potential sightings of James since he left the apartment. An acquaintance claims they saw James on 8-29-2010 in the Sanford area. There was also a reported sighting of James in the Portland, Maine area around a similar date. There have been no clear indications or whereabouts since August 2010. There is no evidence of foul play, but due to James's health, there are concerns for his well-being. Sanford police can't really investigate a missing adult unless there is some indication of foul play, since adults are free to leave as they wish. Police also pointed out they didn't know the relationship that Monica and James really had. Monica passed away in 2014 without knowing what happened to her brother, though he was listed as surviving her in her obituary. Please call 1-207-324-9170 with any information. We return now to Seaver Street in Roxbury, Mass. 396 Seaver Street to be exact, where 45-year-old Hayden Stephen a Brooklyn, New York native, was gunned down at 4 a.m. Saturday, August 28, 2010. 
Hayden was taken and pronounced dead at Boston Medical Center. There is no known motive and no suspects. Please call 1-617-343-4470, 1-800-494-TIPS, or text TIP to CRIME with any information. Anthony Mark Green was a 38-year-old we all wished we had as a co-worker. Anthony was, overall, a good person. Anthony, lovingly referred to as Ant or Ag, was a dad attending a party tied to the Caribbean festival that was occurring in the Roxbury, Dorchester area. Someone shot Anthony several times at 61 Stratton Street in Dorchester, Mass. at 5.55 a.m. August 28, 2010. Although there were witnesses, they were not cooperative with police, and Anthony was brought to Boston Medical Center where he was later pronounced dead. If you were there that day, please speak up. A decade has passed. Kids grew up without their dad. Be brave and call 1-617-343-4470, 1-800-494-TIPS, or text TIP to CRIME. On August 13, 2010, a skull without hair was discovered by The Generation, a commercial fishing vessel, at about 11.25 a.m. The calvarium was recovered during a tow 50 to 60 nautical miles east-southeast of Cape May in Bristol County, Mass. The skull belongs to an unidentified female between the ages of 31 to 70 years old. No other information is available. Please call 1-617-267-6767. Desher J. Johnson Thompson was only 23 when he was shot to death. At 9.45 p.m. August 28, 2010, an unknown assailant shot Besher at 970 Blue Hill Ave in Dorchester, Mass., which is right by the Franklin Park. Besher was transported to Boston Medical Center, where he was pronounced dead. Please call 1-617-343-4470 or 1-800-494-TIPS. If you have any questions, concerns, complaints, please email me at minepodcast at gmail.com. All one word and mine is spelled with two M's, two I's, one N, one E. Please include what your message is about on the subject line. Later, y'all.